So we're going to have a debate this week about the Iranian nuclear deal and Congress's role. I'm very optimistic that Congress in a bipartisan fashion will insist that we review any deal with Iran before congressional sanctions are lifted. That to me is incredibly appropriate. We should have a say about relieving the sanctions that we created in a bipartisan fashion. But beyond having a say, I think we have some obligation to let the administration and the Iranians and others know what would a good deal look like. The idea of this deal or war is not a fair construct. Nobody wants a war, but also no one wants a bad deal. Because a bad deal will lead to a nuclear capable Iran, which will create a nuclear arms race in the Mideast. If the Iranians do not believe the military option is on the table, then I don't think you'll ever get the deal that you would like. And I think after drawing the red line with Assad and doing nothing about it in our general weak foreign policy, it's probably created an impression in the minds of the Ayatollah and others that we're really not serious about military force if it's required. So the best way to avoid a war is to convince people that you may fight that they will lose so they won't go down the road of war. But having said that, a good deal would be a blessing. A good deal would end the nuclear ambitions of the Iranians without firing a shot and would prevent a nuclear arms race in the Mideast. What would a good deal look like? A good deal would allow the Iranians what they claim they want, which is a peaceful nuclear power program and it would deny them the ability to turn that program into a weapon, <coughs> weapons program like North Korea did. So I have outlined eight principles. Can I have a copy? Thank you. Sorry. Do you have a, an, an extra one? Yes. I don't want to take yours. Eight principles of what, eight foundational principles of a good deal. And all of them have a couple things in common. They've either been braced by Republicans and Democrats in a bipartisan fashion. Bipartisan fashion. The UN has embraced these ideas, or the President has embraced the idea himself. So this is not something coming from right field. These are things that I think uh, have uh, passed muster in the past that we need to make sure it's a good deal. That I don't think the framework. Uh, has included or is confusing. First, enrichment. There are 15 nations that have nuclear programs without an enrichment, nuclear power plants without an enrichment program. Canada and Mexico are in that group. You can make a good argument, given the behavior of the Iranians, that they should have be allowed any enrichment capability because you can't trust them and they're so disruptive. We're asking the UAE not to go down the enrichment road. We're asking South Korea not to go down the enrichment road. But if enrichment is required of this deal, here's my bottom line. The enrichment program has to be small, has to be monitored, and it has to be tied to the original purpose of these negotiations, supplying commercial grade fuel for one nuclear power plant. That was the whole concept trying to allow them an enrichment capability that could not be turned into a weapons program like North Korea. And I'm afraid what we're being told, the, the, the quality and the quantity of the centrifuges combined with the R&D takes us well beyond what you would need, the practical needs of an enrichment program to supply one reactor. That would probably be hundreds of centrifuges, not thousands, and you wouldn't need an advanced R&D program. Uh, the second is probably the, the linchpin of any good deal. Anytime, anywhere inspections of non-military and military facilities. I can't imagine a deal getting through the Congress that does not have any time, anywhere inspection requirement including military facilities. 
I can't imagine doing a final deal until the IAEA report is issued about the past military dimensions of the Iranian nuclear program. They're being denied access to military facilities in Iran to do the evaluation. So I don't see how in the world you can do a final deal until you know about the past military dimensions of their program. And I don't think you have any chance of getting a deal through the House or the Senate uh, with a veto, you know, at all that doesn't have any time, anywhere inspection requirements, including military facilities. So when the head of the Iranian military says, you will not come on our military bases, I think that is a deal breaker. The other thing I'll mention very quickly and just take questions is sanction relief. I don't see the Congress agreeing to a deal that would require, that would allow an infusion of tens of billions of dollars into the Iranian economy uh, until certain requirements are met. So lifting the sanctions early on and having sort of a signing bonus is a no-go for me. Sanctions cannot be lifted until there's performance on the part of the Iranians to show that they're complying with the, uh, the, the inspection regime. And finally, what would they do with any additional cash? I think it's going to be a pretty tough sell to give early money to the Iranians, not tied to their compliance, given the fact that they're disrupting the Mideast in the most aggressive way I've seen in 20 years. So what would they do with this money? Build hospitals and schools? I don't think so. I think they would feed their war machine. <clears throat> so it's going to be very difficult for any final deal to get approved that does what the Ayatollah says this framework would allow, the immediate lifting of all uh, sanctions. If the Ayatollah's version of the framework becomes the final deal, there's no way it's going to get out of Congress. The last thing <clears throat> I would mention is that for the sanctions, for the inspection regime to be dismantled, it should not be based just on the passage of time. One principle I have is that any inspection regime we create as a part of a deal cannot be relieved until there's a certification that the Iranians are no longer state sponsors of terrorism. Whether that's at the eight year period or the 10 year period, whatever time period we're talking about, I think that certification requirement's an absolute must that the president, whoever he or she may be at that time, has to certify to the Congress <clears throat> that the Iranian government is no longer a state sponsor of terrorism. And uh, I think that's just good common sense. So with that, I'll take questions. Um, there has been concern that some um, Republicans um, might offer amendments when the bill comes to the floor <coughs> to reinsert the terrorism certification that was stripped out with the Carden Compromise or to um, require no sanctions relief until Iran has answered all IAEA questions. Um, but those amendments could risk Democratic support and get the veto back. I, what are your I, thoughts on that? I, I like the bill as crafted. I could support the bill as crafted. Uh, the certification on terrorism to me is uh, a change that did not modify the, the purpose of the bill. You have a reporting requirement under the legislation about Iranian activity, but uh, I'm okay with the way Bob Menendez and Bob Corker and, and uh, Ben Cardin crafted this bill to my Republican colleagues. The point that I've been trying to establish for over a year now is that we need a chance to look at this deal, we need a chance to vote on this deal, and explain this deal to the American people. As to tying sanction relief to the IAEA report, that is certainly what I would want to see in any final deal. But I'm not going on that amendment because I don't want to destroy the framework that we've created. The key to me is that the Congress has the, has the authority 
to look at the deal, debate the deal, explain it to the American people, and vote on the deal. As to it being a treat, all I can say to my colleagues, uh, you're embracing a concept that I find questionable legally, and I am trying to solve a problem. The problem I'm trying to solve is to make sure that no deal can become binding that would relieve congressional sanctions without our input. Legal experts who I have come to admire on our side of the aisle believe that this does not meet the requirement of a treaty. The Supreme Court has been pretty generous in allowing the executive branch to determine what a treaty would be. So that's a debate that I think um, is not going to be that helpful. I, I, I do believe that the bill is drafted is sound into the critics of the bill. Most of you haven't lifted a finger to solve this problem. Most of you haven't met with one Democrat, so don't parachute in here at the end with a, with an idea that will, will destroy what I think is one of the most important pieces of legislation that I'll ever deal with. Yes, ma'am. What about the idea of um, Obama just going on his own and, and Executive he cannot relieve congressional sanctions by executive action. No, he can if he can continue to waive them. Uh, can, not if this bill passes. He can uh, de designate banks. He can. He cannot lift congressional sanctions if we take the waiver away. That's the whole purpose of the bill. Can you just go back to that process? If um, if folks do have amendments that they want to offer and those are rejected during the amendment process. Um, like you're saying, the IAEA amendment, what would be the, then they can attach that, they could, when, when could that sort of get attached or be part of the broader? Well, what I want to do is make sure we don't destroy the coalition that we've okay. developed. I'd have to, well, the reason I'm non-committal that I don't know exactly how it works. So the certification requirement was what was necessary to get Ben Cardin on the bill. I don't think it substantially changed the bill but it's something that made a difference to him that doesn't affect the outcome to me. And, and out of respect for Ben, I will, I will keep that provision in. Senator, there's been talk about how there will be, need to be additional funding to the IEA for increased inspections, which would mean more year funding from Congress. Um, is that something that you think you and your fellow? I think it would be pretty easy to appro appropriate money to make sure that the Iranians don't cheat if there is a good deal. I would hate to be on record opposing funding that would make the IAEA a better watchdog. Uh, question about what might ultimately happen with this. It's one thing to have Congress have a say, to vote to have Congress have a say. Right. Just the way we all know that Congress wants a say in an AUMF. Having a say is one thing. Agreeing on what you're going to say is a completely different thing. Do you do you think this could end up in the end the way AUMF does? No, we're not. We're not debating uh, how to fight a war. We're saying we're not going to agree to waive congressional. We're we're not. We're going to take the waiver away from the president if we think it's a bad deal. It's taking an existing law that has a waiver that she mentioned. And if the bill, if we get 60 votes to disapprove the deal, the waiver provision in the existing statute is eliminated and uh, sanctions are snapped back. There's no, no intrigue as to what happens. If you get 60 votes to disapprove the deal, then the waiver that she referenced is eliminated. Then you've got to get 67 votes, yeah. Yeah, eventually, He'll have to get, well, if he vetoes it, he'll get 67 votes. But here's my belief, that if you have a bipartisan group of senators rejecting the deal, then they need to start over and get a better deal. To reject the deal doesn't mean that's the end of negotiations. It just simply means go get a better deal. And to get to 60, you got to get some Democratic buy-in. To me, that was a reasonable compromise. The Republican Party alone cannot reject this deal. It's going to take some Democratic buy-in. And if I were Hillary Clinton, uh, I would want to make sure it's a good deal. If I'm running for president on the Democratic side, I wouldn't want to inherit a bad deal. 
and I want to hear what she says about the deal. And the whole process of debating and voting on the deal allows the entire country to understand what we're about to agree to. So at the end of the day, if we can get 60 votes for disapproval, that would be pretty good indication that it's not the deal we would all hope to have. Wanting a deal too badly is dangerous. Not wanting a deal is equally dangerous. I want a deal. I just don't want it to be a bad deal. And if six Democrats join with all the Republicans say, this falls short, I hope the president will take it as constructive input and try to get a better deal. So you won't be offering any amendments, and do, is your sense from the leadership that they also want to... I don't know what the leadership's up to, but anybody that monkeys with this bill is going to run into a buzzsaw. <laughs> <laughs> do you know if there's going to be an open amendment process? Huh? Do you know if there's going to be an open amendment process? I, I, I don't... It'd be fine with me. I mean, everybody can have their say. I mean, there's a, you know, talking about uh, you can't, you know, the Iranians have to recognize Israel as part of this package. Well, one, I don't, what if they said, yeah, I recognize Israel? I don't trust them. Those words mean nothing to me. You know, and, and from BB's point of view, I, I understand where he's coming from, but I'm trying to create a process that will allow us to review a deal that will have consequential effects on the entire region and our national security for the rest of my life and yours. So I don't want to mucky around with this thing to make political points. I want to try to get a process that we can approve a good deal or kill a bad one. Um, Senator, did you see the op-ed um, from the Iranian Foreign Minister in the New York Times earlier this week? I missed it. Well, he, 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 <laughs> said he said some things that are pretty expansive, and he suggests that if a nuclear deal was in place, then Iran wanted to cooperate on a number of issues, returning stability to the region, and he seemed to be indicating he wanted to return to the two-pillar strategy. I don't trust anything he says. At the end of the day, you're never going to get a deal from any rational American president where you give them billions of dollars and they promise to stop blowing up the region. That's crazy. How about stop blowing up the region as a down payment of good faith? You know, the you know, problem with President Obama is he's never bought a car. The Iranians are pretty well known for good negotiators. There's no way in hell I would agree to doing the deal with a promise that I may stop blowing up the Mideast if you give me the deal I want. How about this, Iranians? Stop the destructive behavior that's destabilizing the region and the world before we negotiate with you about your nuclear program. Because given your past record, we nobody in the right mind trust you. The best thing I can say about the Iranian foreign minister is that your country's track record is pretty poor. You're responsible for killing at least 1,500 Americans with copper tipped IEDs. You're supporting the Houthis who have destabilized the pro-American government in Yemen. You're the chief funder of uh, the butcher of the 21st century, Bashar Assad. You support terrorism, Hezbollah, Hamas. You tried to kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States in the United States. Other than that, we're good to go. About a We're going from the Iranian foreign minister to the Rand Paul. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> on him calling you a laptop for the president's phone call. Well, I think that would be news to the White House. <laughs> uh, you know, one, I, I like Senator Paul. None of this is personal for me. It's been pretty clear to anybody in the print media particularly, because y'all follow this closer than your other colleagues do. Uh, so, bottom line, uh, we've had a dispute about foreign policy ever since he's been here. And it's not personal to me. You know, you could say a lot of things about John McCain and Lindsey Graham. Being a lapdog for Obama would be a hard case to make. Uh, I have used every adjective known to mankind to describe President's foreign policy as being falling short of what we would like. And uh, all I can say is that this dispute between Senator Paul and myself has been ongoing, is sincere. Ron Paul, I didn't agree with his foreign policy, but I respected the fact that he truly believed in it. And as to Senator Paul, he seems to be moving. That's a good thing. But at the end of the day, his record, in my view, 
shows a foreign policy vision one step behind leading from behind and all i can say is that if he's the nominee i will support him but if he's the nominee of the party i think we risk giving up the central issue of the 2016 campaign which will be foreign policy i think this will be a foreign policy election and i think senator paul's record on this issue is quite frankly behind that of president obama but let me give you one example of what I'm trying to say. You know, he says he's a Ronald Reagan Republican. Everybody likes Ronald Reagan. But I'm not so sure that what he has done as senator on foreign policy would qualify as a Ronald Reagan Republican. I think it qualifies as a Ron Paul Republican. And there's no shame in that. But you gotta be who you are here. So the Senate, when was this, Matt? A couple years ago? 35. 2012, I, offer, I authored a resolution that said the following. We reject the strategy of giving Iran a nuclear weapon and trying to contain them. For about six months before that resolution, I was challenging President Obama every day, not as a lapdog, but as a critic. Do you accept containment as a viable strategy? give them a nuke and try to contain them. Eventually he said no. I think he said it at the APAC conference. I can't remember where he said it. But the moment he said it, I took his words and turned it into a resolution where we would agree with that statement, the United States Senate. President Obama, when you reject containment of a nuclear armed Iran, we agree with you. We had a, a debate on the floor. We had a vote, 90 to one for my resolution. The one was Rand Paul. He was the only senator that had a hard time embracing the idea you can't let Iran have a nuke and try to contain him because it won't work. I would suggest that Ronald Reagan would have been in the 90, not the one. And to me, anybody who believes that you can allow Iran to get a nuke and contain them doesn't understand, understand the history of Iran and the consequences uh, of that, uh, uh, I think, fatally flawed thinking. Bernie Sanders got it, and I love Bernie, but he's not exactly a hawk. He, he, he was with me on this. So that shows you the breadth of this idea. Can you comment on the uh, trade bill? Uh, amendments matter. I'm a, I think currency manipulation has to be addressed in some meaningful way to get my support. I believe that the currency manipulation of certain Asian nat nations in particular has to be addressed for me to feel good that the American worker will not get cheated out of their jobs. Chinese, Chinese currency manipulation, Japanese currency manipulation, I think has created unfair market advantage for them and it's now time to do something about currency manipulation. Every, every candidate for president says, yes, I'm against China currency manipulation, Japanese currency manipulation, until they get to be president. Then all of a sudden, they're not against this anymore. If there's not strong currency language, I will not vote for it. Can you talk all about Senator Cardin's amendment that would discourage U.S. trading partners from supporting the BDS movement? Starting what? Uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions against Central. Oh, I like that amendment. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Do you mean? <laughs> that was a good one. Okay. Uh, can you talk about the Camp David? Do you know that one's going to have the Yeah, I'm worried. To my, to our Arab friends, if you get packaged, if you get promised a big deal, I mean a big arms package, and in any way that's tied to your support for a, uh, a deal with Iran, beware. I don't know what they're gonna talk about. I'm glad he's talking to, uh, to our GCC uh, Sunni Arab allies, but this idea of a massive infusion of arms into these countries tied to any Iranian deal you know, even sub Rosa will be met with fierce resistance. Right now, the Mideast is pretty unstable. 
I don't mind upgrading the uh, military capabilities of our Arab allies, but it's got to be done in a way not to tip the balance of power in the region. And if there's any, if it has a hint of being connected to the Iranian deal, I'll do everything I can to make sure they never get one bullet or one plane. Senator, you said uh, you expect 2016 to be a foreign policy election. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? What issues do you think are going to be decided? The world is falling apart, and I think that will be noticed. I have never seen more threats to our homeland than I do today. I've never seen more terrorist organizations, armies, with the capability, the desire, the money, the men, the safe havens to attack America than any time before 9-11. And it is a direct result, in my view, of <coughs> disengagement leading from behind a light footprint strategy. And Hillary Clinton, who was his Secretary of State, is going to be asked about the world in such a deteriorated condition. Uh, the worst is yet to come. If we don't deal with Syria soon, the contagion in Syria is going to take down our friends in Jordan and Lebanon. So when you see the disorder in the world, if, Le if Yemen is a good result, what would a bad one look like? I just can't imagine that the threats we face from growing radical Islam, radical Islam is running wild. I can't imagine that that's not part of the uh, discussion of 2016. It, would that be an argument for a senator of more senior standing in foreign policy jobs to enter the race? I think that'd be an argument for someone with an accent. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be an argument that the, our nominee needs to uh, be able to reject Obama's foreign policy with credibility, tie Hillary Clinton to a failed foreign policy, to have expressed an alternative view when it mattered, and to have the to have the background and experience to convince the American people that war is a terrible thing. Let's keep the war from coming here, and that's going to require some of us to go over there to form lines of defenses. That leading from the front is better cost-benefit analysis than leading from the rear. And uh, at the end of the day, the commander-in-chief question will enlarge. And I hope that our nominee, if it is not me, will be able to make a forceful case that they will be a good commander-in-chief and they will break this the deteriorating uh, cycle of Barack Obama's failed foreign policy. That's why I'm concerned about Senator DePaul. I think he would have the worst chance of anybody to make a case against Obama's foreign policy. Uh, a couple of examples. President Obama believes he has the authority to kill Anwar al who is an American citizen, the leader of al-Qaeda in Yemen, without a court order. He does. I've been a military lawyer for 33 years. <clears throat> an, an unlawful enemy combatant can be captured or killed under the law of war. We're not fighting a crime. In many ways, President Obama has tried to turn the war into a crime, and some people on our side have even gone further down that road. Under the law of war, if you engage in hostilities against the United States, you join al-Qaeda or an allied force, you're subject to being killed or captured under the law of war, that is an executive branch decision as to who the enemy is, not a court. So there was a time when Senator Paul wanted a court to decide who the enemies of the nations were. That's not what judges are set to do. And just a couple of days ago, he mentioned that I was for detaining people without a trial. Absolutely, I'm for detaining enemy combatants under the law of war consistent with law of war due process. We're not fighting a crime. A member of Al-Qaeda is not a member of the mob. They're a member of an organization whose goal it is to attack the country and destroy our way of life. A member of Al-Qaeda or an affiliated group is an enemy combatant under the law of war, an unlawful enemy combatant. They can be held under the law of war until they're no longer a threat. There is no concept in the law of war of releasing somebody who's still a threat while the war is ongoing. Criminal law doesn't apply here. So they've all been before a federal judge, 
but we do have the legal ability to hold them as long as they're a threat. The war is not over, it is getting worse. So the idea you gotta offer a trial to an enemy combatant takes the war and turns it into a crime. Well, in that line of thought, would you say that detainees from Afghanistan during Guantanamo think the legal authority to hold them as we withdraw our troops will diminish? Let's say that again. We got so we have detainees in Guantanamo from Afghanistan who are I thought we gave them all back. We didn't. Okay, well let's keep them there if they're a threat to us in Afghanistan. Even if we don't have troops in Afghanistan? Yes, because the war is not against Afghanistan, it's against us. Al-Qaeda doesn't just want to take over Afghanistan. I don't want to release anybody from Guantanamo Bay that will that has a likelihood of rejoining terrorist organizations to strike us or our allies. That's what the war is about. I mean, this idea you had to release a German prisoner or Japanese prisoner to date certain would have been hard to sell in World War II. Now, when the war is over and the threat is passed, it's a different deal. I would argue this war is not over and the threat is not passed. I would argue that anybody you release in Guantanamo Bay now is very likely to go back to the fight. We've had a 30% recidivism rate. And most of these people are being detained by military intelligence gathering apparatus, not a criminal apparatus. When you capture an enemy prisoner, the goal is to keep them off the battlefield and gather intelligence, not to prosecute them. Every military lawyer understands that when you capture an enemy prisoner, you want to keep them off the battlefield and gather intelligence. You don't want to turn it into a criminal process. You can do that, but you're not required to do that. You said when the war is over, then it's a different story. But if it's a war against terrorism, then will it ever be over? In I think the people in Guantanamo Bay are probably going to die in jail. And that's okay with me. As long as they get due process. They've been before a federal judge, and the judge says the evidence of the United States government is sufficient to label you a member of Al-Qaeda or an affiliated group. They get an annual review as to whether or not they're still a threat. Some of these people are going to be considered a threat probably until they draw their last breath. If, if hostilities are still ongoing, which I think they will be, some of these guys will die in jail. So don't join Al-Qaeda if you don't want to get killed or die in jail. And speaking of 2016, would a President Graham accept a bill that would allow Congress to weigh in on essentially an executive agreement with another I would insist, if I were president, that this deal be reviewed by the American people, signed off by the Congress, because I would not want a deal of this consequence not to be a shared responsibility. I believe that the best thing that the president could do is negotiate a good deal with the, Cong uh, with the Iranians in the minds of the president, submit it to the Congress and see if it passes scrutiny, and see if the American people believe it's a good deal. And if the Congress told me it wasn't a good deal, <clears throat> I would want to try to get a better deal. Because no deal is better than a bad deal, but a good deal is the goal. So count me in for a good deal. I'm trying to give you an outline of what a good deal would look like. What do you think about the future of the AUMF? I think the AUMF is probably in purgatory right now because the AUMF as drafted does not allow us to engage Assad's forces if they attack the Free Syrian Army we're training. So when you, when you send Free Syrian troops that you train into Syria under the construct that we have, they can only fight ISIL, which I think is absurd. But if Assad sees them as a threat and launches an air campaign against them, the AMF does not allow us to engage Besides air power, so you're sending people to their certain death, which I think is immoral and does not achieve the objective I want in Syria. So I'm not going to bless an AMF that that does not allow us to protect the people we train. Senator, Last question. What are your thoughts on Saudi's new muscular foreign policy and their efforts in? Europe? Well, I think it's a reaction to a vacuum created by us, and I think they're handling this pretty haphazardly. And one day they're going to stop bombing, and the next day they bomb. At the end of the day, the one thing I would say is that American leadership is essential to hold the world together. We're the glue that holds 
and the free world together. We're the glue that creates order rather than chaos. And the Sunni Arab states no longer trust President Obama. They're sort of making this up as they go. And I don't believe that Saudi Arabia and the Arab coalition quite knows how to deal with Yemen. I want to dislodge the Houthis, get a peace agreement so they can live peacefully in Yemen. But the main thing I'm worried about is Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula is the biggest beneficiary of a broken Yemen. As we debate what to do, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula is running wild, and they're probably the most lethal group out there to hit us. And uh, so the Arabs, particularly Saudi Arabia, has hit a lot of targets. They don't know how this movie ends. They don't have a strategy to basically reset Yemen. Resetting Yemen requires a political reconciliation with the Houthis. I get that. But Iran is the source of most mischief. And if I were President of the United States, I'd tell the Iranians, I'm not going to talk to you anymore about your nuclear program until you get the Houthis back at the table and stop this madness in Yemen because Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is a threat to everybody. And just to follow up, um, when I was in Saudi Arabia last week, there was a sense that um, they have their eye on Syria next. Do you think that's a good idea? No, yes. Every Sunni Arab state is beyond upset with us about our policy toward Assad. That's why they don't trust Obama with Iran. No Arab army is going into Syria as part of a coalition until we commit to getting rid of Assad. They see Assad as a magnet of recruiting for ISIL. They see Assad as a puppet of Iran. They see Assad as one of the most destabilizing forces surrounding their neighborhood. They're going to go after him one day. And I fear that if we're not with them, that this thing could be a complete disaster. So Turkey is willing to go in. Egypt's willing to go in. Saudi told me and Senator McCain and others, you can have our army. The, uh, uh, the Emir of Qatar said, we will pay for the war. <coughs> but we have to get rid of Assad. Our reluctance to engage Assad is directly related not to offending the Iranians because they want a deal so badly with the Iranians, they can't openly talk about taking the side down because they think it will disrupt their relationship with the Iranians. The Arab Sea aside is the source of most mischief backed by Iran. So we're in a spot where our, our desire to get a deal with Iran is making ISIL stronger because you'll never degrade or destroy ISIL without a Syrian component. You're never going to get an Arab army to go in Syria just to fight ISIL. And if the Arabs go by themselves, only God knows what's going to happen. That would be a, a very dangerous scenario where the Arabs invade Syria, taking on Assad and Iran with ISIL in the middle without us there. Because I worry about their capability to win, and I don't want to turn the Mideast into a complete Sunni-Shia bloodbath. And that's where we're headed. You know, Yemen is the first sign of this conflict, but if you had an Arab invasion of Syria without some international, without us, this thing could turn into a complete Sunni-Shia bloodbath. Real quick, Senator, do you support the, uh, the straight reauthorization of the Patriot Act that Foreign Supreme was produced? Uh, I would entertain some reforms if they made sense to me, but my number one goal with the Patriot Act, Patriot, Patriot Act is to make sure we don't have another 9-11. Any amendment on this bill that would, in my view, weaken our ability to stop another 9-11, I will oppose. I will not vote for a Patriot Act that does that, that is compromised to the point that we can't have uh, the best defense against another 9-11. I honestly believe that the Patriot Act were in being, there would have never been a 9-11. High probability there would never been a 9-11. And the purpose of the Patriot Act, in my view, is to prevent another 9-11. If we can reform some of these programs and make them more transparent without helping the enemy count me in. But my number one goal about the Patriot Act is to make sure that we have the tools necessary to prevent another 9-11. And I can tell you this without any hesitation. The system we have today is about to be overrun. There are too many of these groups, too many people with access to this country to avoid an attack if this continues. 
So the capabilities we have today to monitor uh, foreign fighters who have Western passports and access to our country is being challenged unlike any time I've seen. So the last thing I want to do is reduce those capabilities. Yeah, the, the, the flood of refugees is bad on multiple levels. One is about to strain the Lebanese and Jordanian economy. Uh, refugee camps can be terrorist recruiting areas. Uh, how do you allow somebody to come into Lebanon and Jordan is a vetting process. The, the source of the refugees is Assad. The source of the problem is Assad's killing of his own people. So what I would suggest is that we stop, go to the cancer, stop doing giving people aspirin, get to the heart of the problem, which is stopping the reason we have so many refugees, which is to come up with a game plan to take Assad out and I really do believe if you had such a game plan, the Russians would leave him, let him go, and you could get a political reconciliation, reconciliation inside of Syria. But the key to political reconciliation inside of Syria is getting Assad out. So the refugee problem is a symptom of a greater problem. Thank you. Thank you.